All right. So, uh, remember, we are on Easter break starting, uh, um, well, we won't have class on Friday. Uh, what is it? Class is after 4 p.m. today. Or, uh, or, or not meeting, something along those lines. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned at the end of class last time, uh, I was going to show you how to do animations real quick. Um, we'll use them a little bit for our uh, uh, fight scene. So I already created a simple uh, uh, little one, but I'll kind of walk you uh, through it. Uh, and then we'll try to attach it to our fight thing today, but I have a little demo we can look at. Um, doesn't take very long. I'll just take you through the process. So if you want to create a uh, animation, um, what you would do is, uh, well, I guess, first of all, everybody can hear me okay. I'm not just talking to the wall. You can hear me. You can see my screen. Yeah. The, okay, got it. All right, so what you'll do is inside Unity, you'll go up to Window, and you'll choose the Animation window. And when you open that, it, it uh, will probably pop up as a separate window for you. What I did is I just, you know, it probably looked like this for you initially. What I did is I grabbed the tab here and I just drug it down and I kind of put it next to my assets folder. So it was kind of conveniently there. The real reason for that is... Um, let me just pick on a different guy here. Here, we'll actually, we'll create an animation for our, uh, our our pink ghost. All right, so I'll click on this guy. Now notice in our animation thing, we can create an animation um, for this guy. So I'll go ahead and do that. I'll create an animation and we're going to call this guy ghost. <laughs> Wait, that's not how you spell ghost. That's not how you spell <laughs> How do you spell ghost? Ghost. Fight. Animation. And I already created a folder in here for animations. And I have a chomp one in there. But we'll make this our ghost fight animation. So I'll hit save here. So that creates this brand new animation. Now, a lot of times when you download stuff off of uh, um, the Unity uh, play, uh, store or whatever it comes with some animations and i bet you that is the case here with like chomp um let's see chomp we have some prefabs we have audio do we really not have animations in here that can't be right i'm not going to use it anyways it would just surprise me he didn't have like a little pac-man uh animation Okay, well, whatever. Um, so in any case, I selected my uh, um, my dude here. We created a new uh, animation for him. And notice now he has an animator uh, 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 set, up, uh, set up here. So what I'm going to do is we're going to have him uh, maybe move forward and then move back when he's uh, attacking uh, let's say something like that. So over here, we're going to add a property. We'll choose uh, our transform. Specifically, we'll choose position. All right. So we're going to be working with the position of this guy as we uh, um, start. So initially, he's going to be in his current position. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move our time a little bit. Maybe to there. And we're going to change his position. We'll move him forward some. All right. So that's 22.93. So we'll set that position. And then this last position is here. We're going to go ahead and take this 
and move it back here. So that's back to his uh, original position. Where's his original position? I'm going to have to save it. Put position back. So there's his original position at the... Uh, end. And that's where he's at now, right? 22 and negative 805. Okay. So I'm going to copy this component real quick, just so I can get it. Uh, so position's good enough. That's all I need to copy. All right. Then I'm going to move him forward some. Okay. And then we're going to move him back some. back to his original position. All right, and this last state I can So if you see here, I'm just setting up a couple of different key positions for him. Um, I'm going to actually shorten the entire uh, thing here. Twenty-two. Okay, so there's his whole ninja move. And we can hit play on it and see him jump back and forth. All right, so we're going to call that our, I don't know, whatever, our, our animation for this dude. Um, okay, so now he has a uh, um, uh, an animation. We've we've saved it inside of our animation folder. Notice I already have a chomp one. So when I click on this dude and then we go over here to the controller, and we double uh, click on it. So just to show you that again, let me go back to the my ghost from the scene. So over here in his animator, under controller, this is the thing that was created, this guy right here that was just created by us. Go ahead and double click on it. And what it brings us to is this thing called the state machine. All right. Um, now, by default, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and show you this. You know the uh, uh, the ghost fight will start. He'll he'll move, and then we want him to we'll create a transition, and ultimately it'll exit. So creating a transition, you'll just right click, say create, uh, make transition, and then drag to where you want it to go. So when we enter this animation, he'll start his little ghost fighting dance, which has him going you know forward and then back. And then we will uh, end. We're not putting any constraints on this whatsoever. All right, so this is effectively like the, uh, um, you can think of a state machine like a graphical computer program, something along those lines. All right, so now when I hit play here, you'll see that our ghost is uh, attacking over and over and over again, uh, because all this guy does is, is have an animation that uh, uh, is running because he is a game object that has an animator attached to it that has a controller that says, keep playing this animation over and over and over again. All right. So what we want to do is we want to have some sort of control over that animation. So I'll go ahead and go back into our state machine. So we can add conditionals here um, to make it so that it only happens uh, some, sometimes. Now, by default, when we this is where we enter the uh, um, the animation, 
um, and it goes right to our uh, fight animation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to right click. I'm going to create. Um, actually, hold on. Let me do this. I want to create a new state. So we're going to create a state. I just right clicked out here. We'll pick empty for now. I'm going to go ahead and click on this state, right click on it. And I'm going to say, I want to set this as the default state. All right. So when our animation first starts, we'll jump to this default state. Now I'm going to make a transition from our default state to our ghost fight animation. I'm going to click on that transition. And what I want to do is I want to add a constraint to that. All right. So over here on the left, you see we have this thing called parameters. We can associate variables that can be turned on or turned off. So if I go in here, I can create a float, an int, a Boolean, or a trigger. All right. Um, what I'm going to do for this, since we want the animation to effectively play one time, um, like a one shot animation, we're going to have a trigger that basically says, um, tell the animation to go and it'll play one time and be done. Otherwise, you can create like a, for instance, a Boolean. Um, maybe we call this guy attack. And it's off by default, let's say. And we can say, well, we want to create a conditional for when we want our guy to attack. So we click on that transition. We come over here to the right. Under conditions, we hit plus, And we say we want to start playing this animation whenever this attack variable is true. Notice it starts off as false. OK. And then we want to exit. So we want the animation to go from making him attack to an exit state whenever it gets set back to false. So if we're currently in this state and this Boolean gets set to false, we will transition from this state to be done. If we're currently in our very first state, because we made this the starting state uh, for our animation, we transition to him actually moving once this guy turns to true. All right. But it started off as false. So if I go ahead and hit play now, we notice that he is not moving because that value is currently false, not true. If I go back into my animator... And I change the default value of that guy to true. Now we see he's moving. All right. So for our little example here, I'm going to leave it as false as our starting point. And then we're going to see the difference between this and a uh, trigger for it. So I'll go ahead and turn attack back to uh, uh, false for the default. That way he won't automatically transition. Just to reiterate that. Since attack starts off as false. And we. Enter this animation going to this new state. If you want me to change the name of this guy. I can. Did I not change the name of it? Did I, did I miss that opportunity? There's probably a way to do it, but. It's going to leave it alone. Okay, so I will always start off in this state, but I'm not going to go from this state to the actual animation unless I'm able to traverse this transition. And I'm only allowed to traverse this transition if attack is currently true, which right now it's false. All right, so we want to maybe programmatically handle that. So what I'll do is I'm going to go back in here. We're going to create a script. Uh, it's going to be a mono behavior, so we're going to attach something to our ghost that allows us to manipulate its animator. All right, so I will call this guy. Um, let's see, what did I call this guy? 
Alpha. That's the flight controller. Um, that'll be okay for it. Let me just write it uh, a second one here, just to show it from scratch. We might delete it later. So we're going to call this guy the ghost flight controller. And then we're going to go ahead and add that component to our ghost. So here's our ghost fight controller. And then we'll go ahead and open that guy up. So our ghost fight controller looks like any other um, normal mono behavior. But now we need to access a couple of these components. Namely, we want to be able to make this animator start playing. All right, so we're going to need access to this animator uh, component. So I'm going to create a private variable up here. It's going to be an animator. We'll call this guy the animator. Inside of start, we could have done it up there, but inside of start, I'll go ahead and say this dot the animator is equal to this dot game object dot get component animator. All right, so that will give me that animator component. If you remember correctly, I technically didn't have to say game object here. I could have just said this dot get component, uh, but I like being explicit with it. All right, so we're going to ask the game object that this script is attached to to get us one of its components, which component? It's animator component using generics. This will then give me a, a variable here, the animator, that allows me to work with that guy. And just for... A quick example, I'll say the animator dot um, play. Actually, it starts it at a uh, state name. So let's actually just do it uh, this way. We're going to say this dot the animator dot set boolean. And we name that guy attack. And we want to set it to true. All right, so just to remind you here, going back in here, if I go over to our animator and I double click, I start off in this state here, and I can only go to my animation state when attack is set to true. Attack started off as false. So what am I doing? I am programmatically getting that animator and then setting attack to true, which should now have our ghost animating again when the scene first starts probably not what we really wanted to do but it'll work anyways all right so now he's just animating all right now why is he continue to animate well he's going to keep animating let me go back to that state machine He's going to keep in this state right here that we just transitioned to when we turned it to true. He's going to keep doing this until we're able to transition out of this state, which is going to require us to have attack set back to false. So we could do some kind of timer and say after two seconds, set it back to false or something like that. Uh, or we could maybe uh, associate it inside of update with a key press. Uh, so let's kind of look at that. We'll... Do something like um, if input dot uh, get button up key code dot, uh, I don't know, S <laughs> for no good reason. Okay, so if the user pressed the S key and lift it up, so if we get button up S, then we'll say this dot the animator set boolean attack to false. What aren't you happy with?
Oh, that should be fine. Oh, does it? It's not a button. It's I think a get key up. There we go. Get key up. Otherwise, you have to if you use get button up. You have to give it the string representation of it. So if they press and release the S key, um, in, you know, at any point in time, then we're going to turn that attack thing to false, which will then transition us out of the animation state um, into a uh, uh, the the end state. We're done. So I'll go here and we'll run that guy again. And he starts animating. I'm going to hit S. And he stopped animating. All right. Now, I already did something very similar over there with the uh, um, uh, chomp associated with the space bar. So if I hit the space bar, he does a single one-off animation. I don't have to hit it again to stop. So kind of showing that when he attacks, we're going to have him do a, you know, a quick little attack. And then the animation stops. So we're just using it for that. Now, keep in mind, you can create multiple animations for, uh, you know, your your different guys. And then you can have uh, a state machine that calls upon different animations during different uh, time periods. Um, so you don't only have to work with a single animation. That's just what we have here. Um, so once you go back into this guy your controller for it you can start creating all sorts of sub-state machines around animations and uh um things like that so you play a different animation than our goat ghost uh fight animation for example all right so in our example here we're only playing the animation one time so just to show you the uh the code for chomp and how it's different let me show you first of all, I'll click on Chomp. Notice Chomp has an animator just like before. And if you saw a second ago, Chomp moves his head side to side. He rotates instead of uh, um, translating his position. So we'll go ahead and click on Chomp's state machine. Notice it's pretty similar. But notice here that I have my variable attack is of type trigger. All right. So that's kind of this one-off type thing where it just says animation go. So the animation is in a stop state by default. Okay, so it's the triggers off. And that takes us here. And we only transition to our guy moving if attack has been triggered. And then what it's going to do is it's going to run this animation to fruition and then go towards exit. All right. I'll show you the code here for that guy. So just like we did for the ghost, we have our animator. We have our game object for our animator. If we hit the space bar, I associated it with our space bar here. We'll set the trigger for attack, which makes him start attacking. Okay. So if I run this, he is his trigger state is currently off. When I hit the space bar, he will get triggered, will trigger attack, will play his animation and be done. Now, can we do the same thing with our ghost without turning attack into trigger? Well, we can remove our conditions here. So we can say that from ghost fight animation, we can immediately go to exit without there being a conditional um, transfer. And I think this guy will not loop. We might have to go in and change the uh, animation to not loop because it might be on loop by default. Um, in fact, we can just check that here real quick. Um, here's our chomp fight animation. Uh, I'm sorry, I want to do our ghost one, right? Here's our ghost animation. Ah, notice it is currently on loop time. So I'm going to not change that for a second so we can see what happens. Okay, yeah, so he's on a loop right now. 
So what I'll do is I'll just turn off loop time. Run this guy again. Oh, it's going to still loop. Is there a way for me to make that stop without going to a trigger? Is a good question. There might not be. Yeah, I don't think there is one without uh, writing code to do it with the Boolean. Uh, what you could do, but you'd either have to associate it with another button or you'd have to uh, maybe put a timer that says after the animation uh, finishes running. There's maybe an animation uh, did end event, something like that. Animation event. So you probably can pull it off by having the uh, uh, the animator or the animation trigger, you know, let you know when it's finished going, and then you can set the boolean back to uh, um, false, so it would transition out. Um, but we see here that with a trigger, it only runs one time. So for right now, I mean, you can mess with animations, getting them, getting them working the way you want them to work, or whatever, but. Uh, if you want it to run just one time without having to do a whole bunch of extra coding to turn it off, then turn it back on through setting booleans or floats or, or, or something like that, um, then you can go ahead and, uh, I mean, we could set it up where um, once we start the animation, maybe we could put a collider here or something like that where he bumps into something, which would then set it back to false so it could leave. You can do some stupid stuff like that, I suppose. But if we go and look at Chomp's code, we see that Chomp, when we press the space bar right now, so maybe it's when it's his turn to attack. You know, we're going to be writing that code here in a minute. Uh, we just set the trigger to attack, and he does a single pass through his uh, animation. Whoa, there it is. Space bar. Go ahead and stop our ghost. I hit S. Space bar. <laughs> All right, so only when we hit the space bar will he attack right now. Okay, so that's kind of your quick little example of animations. If you want to start putting some of this uh, uh, stuff into your, your code. Um, realistically, since we have a script here called... Um, uh, what did I call it for our... Uh, Chomp is called Chomp Fight. That's the animation. Yeah, Chomp Fight Animation Controller. So that is what I call the script. So it's not just called Fight Controller. As opposed to the Ghost Fight uh, Controller. All right, so this fight controller, this other guy, is the, what we had started writing last time and probably where you did your uh, your homework. So here's our chomp fight controller. Here's our ghost fight controller. Okay, so I'll just go in quickly to our ghost fight controller and um, let's set this guy to a trigger just so they both kind of work the same. Um, we probably could actually just have an attack uh, controller since they both have this attack thing that turns it on or off. Um, that actually would work. Uh, but let's not complicate things right now. We'll just have separate controllers in case we want to do something special when each one attacks or something like that. That'll be okay. So I'm going to come up here in our ghost. I'm going to go ahead and actually I'm in chomp right now. I need to go back to my ghost. Go to the ghost thing here. I'm going to first right click and I'm going to delete attack here. Then I'm going to add a trigger. 
And we'll call this guy attack as well, but this is no longer a Boolean, now it's a trigger. To go from our current start state to this fight animation, it's going to happen whenever, actually, it automatically updated it for us, but I'll put it into an empty state. I'll just say condition is attack. So if attack gets triggered, we'll go into this animation here. It'll run to fruition, and then we'll transition into exit. All right, that's only when we trigger uh, that guy. Now, right now, we have it set up for the key S, just so we can uh, test it real quick. All right, we're in our ghost. So what we'll do here is we won't start him animating initially. If they press the S key, then what we'll do is we will set a trigger called attack. So I kind of pulled the trigger on that particular animation. So right now, ghost animates when I hit S. Chop animates when I hit spacebar. Neither of them should be animating by default. So here's my spacebar. And then here's my ghost on S. Okay. So that's what attacks are going to look like for right now. You, I'm sure, will be much more imaginative than I am. Uh, but that gives you an idea of how animations work. Uh, if you want to explore these more, like I said, you can go and uh, get one of these uh, packages off of the the uh, the App Store thing on here, the Unity Store. There's a bunch of free free things, and you can see how complicated animations can get with five or six different things, like you know Mario running or jumping and that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can just see you can make those state machines for those different uh, um, things, and you can basically do all of it through uh, uh, with drag and drop and then just modify the value of variables for what you want your guy to do at different points in time. Uh, okay, so any questions on animation stuff before we go and kind of do our back and forth with our, um, uh, our, our fight? Okay, so for right now, let's just get a back and forth thing going and and just see our guys visually try to attack each other. So we're going to go into, uh, actually, just to remind myself here, here's my fight controller game object. The fight controller currently knows about the hero, and he also knows about the monster, and he has access to their text meshes for updating the text and stuff on them. But right now, let's just go back and forth between our hero and our monster for uh, them attacking. And we'll set those triggers each time that they attack. Click on... Well, I'll just do it over here. It's fine. Where is fight controller? All right. So we'll not update our hero's text anymore. We'll leave it where it's at. All right, so we have our um, uh, hero and our monster. Now, you could always have a thing where who gets to go first. Um, otherwise, you know, we can flip a coin for who gets to go first if we want. Um, so I'll just go in here. Oh, what is it? Random dots range. Where's a random range? Random range takes a float min max. Oh, that's deprecated. So it looks like range is the current one. Can I ask for a random int or I have to convert it? Oh, there's one overload to it. So random dot range. Shoot. And let's give this guy a, uh, well, here we can say um, zero to 100. So we have one that takes an int and a max. And the last one is exclusive. So why don't we say a minimum value of zero, 
a maximum value of two just to create our little coin flip thing. So coin flip will produce zero and one since two is not included. All right, if we just wanna see that real quick, we can just do a quick little for loop, print i is equal to zero, i is less than 10, i plus plus, grab that line, and we'll do, um, here, let's just say int num is equal to that. Then we'll say, uh, let's see, I am in a mono behavior, so I can just print. And we'll print some asterisks here and then tack on our number. So we should see a roughly uh, random distribution of zeros and ones representing a coin flip out there at our console. So we'll do it 10 times just to see that we're getting the kinds of values that we want. Go back to Unity here, hit play, click on our console. Zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. Okay, we're gonna call that good. Okay. So we can decide based on the zero or one who gets to go first is kind of what I was thinking. Uh, otherwise you can always let your, your, your hero go first if you uh, want. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say um, private game object, um, current attacker we'll go ahead and get our random number and one thing we could do here is since we're going to probably be having a lot of random number stuff in here uh, we could create our own dice class uh, for this or we could just create a little private function in here, private int get random int int. You know what? That's kind of what random range already does. So let's not get fancy with it. We might create a dice roller later for our attacks. So we'll go ahead and get a random number. We'll ask the question if num is equal to zero, then we'll say this dot current attacker is equal to we'll say our hero else this dot current attacker is equal to our monster all right so at the beginning of each uh, scene or whatever we will uh, uh, we want to alternate between who's our current attacker and who's not our current attacker. Um, we can put some sort of delay. Maybe we do this as a uh, um, uh, our own little thread. If you remember, we had the uh, um, what do they call co uh, co routines um, with a timer or something like that. If we want to have like an attack last a certain amount of time. Uh, otherwise, if we just do it inside of update, these guys are just going to keep bouncing back and forth. So we can see that real quick. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll say, um, I'm just going to give myself a private variable here. We'll give myself an animator. We'll call this guy the current animator. So then inside of update, what we'll say is this dot the current animator is equal to this dot the current, I'll just call current attacker, dot get component animator. So whoever is currently attacking, we'll go ahead and get his animator. And then we'll say this dot the current animator dot set trigger for attack since they both have that same variable all right then we want to flip who's our current attacker so if current attacker is equal to this dot hero game object this dot current attacker is equal to this dot monster game object 
to front. Otherwise, this dot current attacker is equal to this dot hero game object. All right, so an update will grab, grab whoever the current attacker's animator is. We'll set its trigger to tell it to attack, which makes him do his animation. Then we'll flip who's the current attacker. And this is all going to happen way too quickly right now because these are happening every single frame. Uh, and if you, uh, um, well, uh, we're going to get to see some performance issues here since those animations took, I don't know, like a half a second to run, a quarter of a second to run, whatever. Uh, way more uh, is going to happen way slower than our uh, number of frames. Um, in fact, we might even see the animator start over each time. Let's let's see what kind of goes down with it. So it actually almost kind of works because it is not actually um, allowing us. Well, we probably are setting the trigger, so we're probably actually skipping uh, 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 skipping turns here. But while the animation is currently playing, we can't set the trigger again, so it's skipping between these guys. Maybe not the end of the world, but still a little wonky, maybe. Okay. Um, so we could do this on some sort of timer if we want the attack to only last a, a certain uh, period of time. Um, but let's give these guys some hit points uh, first. So since we're already going to be random, uh, rolling some other random number stuff, why don't we go ahead? Um, well, now let's leave. Rather than create another class, let's just do the random dot thing whenever we need it. Okay, so where our player is born, is inside of our dungeon. So for a player, when a player first comes into existence, a player is going to have just a name right now. Uh, same thing with inhabitants. So we're going to say all inhabitants maybe have hit points. So let's go back to inhabitant. Let's create a protected int HP. And we're also going to have a protected int AC for armor class. All right. And we want to randomly generate these guys. So when an inhabitant is first born, why don't we say that this dot HP is equal to random dot range. And let's say the smallest number of hit points we'll let them have is 10. And the maximum is 15, maybe. So put a 16 in there to get it. So this would be between 10 and 15. Similarly, we'll do the same thing with armor class. So AC, why don't we have, uh, we'll probably be rolling a D20 to see if we clear their armor class, if that's kind of taking from like Dungeons and Dragons rules, let's say it's, a, it's a, they all currently use a, what's called the D20 gaming system. So why don't we say that they can have an armor class of between eight and, I don't know, eight and 16 to see if they're, they're hittable. All right, so every single time an inhabitant is created, he will have uh, a hit points and an armor class. Now, we don't want to create a brand new player uh, when we first go into our fight scene. Instead, we want that player to exist as part of our singleton. So our sing singleton has our player. The player is uh, uh, set here when we first generate our dungeon. But who calls generate dungeon? Generate dungeon was something that got called in our other scene. So if we go to our scenes, 
Here's our dungeon scene. Remember we had our dungeon controller here? And our dungeon controller is operated by a dungeon controller script. And here's our dungeon controller script. And it is, is this the guy that sets the uh, set doors? All right, he's not the one who sets it. So did we do it in player? Where did we set the dungeon? Start room for dungeon, dungeon controller. Who calls this guy? All right, so I'm gonna show you another feature of uh, uh, most IDs. So I wanna find out where we're actually calling generate dungeon. So I'm gonna right click on this guy I'm going to go to uh, where were the show references, find references. So it's going to show me the places where we're calling this guy. Uh, oh, so we're calling him inside of my single. Oh, we're calling it right there. Perfect. That actually is quite handy um, for what we're uh, doing here. So when my singleton first comes into existence, We'll define all these variables. The dungeon is calling his generate dungeon function right off the bat, which is going to set um, all the rooms and things like that. But that only ever happens once. And while this, why this is fairly good for us right now is it does not rely on us calling our uh, dungeon um, room, our room dungeon thing first before we get into a fight scene. We can actually work directly with fight scenes since our players will all have hit points now. We can just see that real quick in our last minute if I go to our where's my fight controller? Go into our fight controller and inside of start, I'll just do it for our text mesh here. I'll go ahead and say this dot Hero HP, blah, blah, blah. Um, text is equal to, um, say, I don't remember what it currently says. We'll just say current hit points. And we'll say my singleton dot current or dot the player. Now, we don't have access to his hit points here, so we'll probably want something like get HP. And then we'll concatenate onto that a space, then maybe AC, then a space, my singleton dot the player dot get AC. All right. So that'll be what we update that string to. I just have to go right get HP and get AC real quick inside of inhabitants. So we'll say public get HP. Return this dot HP. And this guy's gonna return an int. Similarly, we'll say public and get ac it's got to return this dot ac so we gave that ability to our inhabitants now which will then translate the players and monsters we haven't actually created an instance of player uh, of monster yet but we do have an instance of player so we'll go into our fight scene we'll hit play and we'll see that our player has 14 hit points and an armor class of 10 if I run this again, presumably he'll have new values, 15 and 13, so on and so forth. Okay, so that puts us in a position to create our instance of a monster when a fight starts and then have these guys go back and forth until somebody dies and we'll probably do a death animation or something. Uh, okay, so no homework over break. 
Um, so the next time I'll see you is on um, a week from today, right? Wednesday, since we're off Friday and we're also off on Monday. So I will see you on Wednesday. If you're traveling, have a safe uh, trip. Uh, and I'll see everybody next week. And I'll update this code. So if you're going to mess around with this over a break, you'll have the uh, the up-to-date code.